Well, welcome, and thank you all for coming this afternoon. We are so excited. I'm Paula Roberts, and I'm chair of the Metro Nashville Arts Commission. Um, I'd like to recognize a few people that are in the room with us today. Um, we have Councilman Ronnie Stein. Councilman, thank you for coming. Thank you for your continued support of the arts. Uh, we also have former Councilman Mr. Phil Ponder. And then I understand that there are representatives from a few of the mayoral candidates. Um, I believe David Fox's group is here. Okay, yay. Um, Charles Robert Bone. Yay, okay. And then one of the candidates for council, uh, Jeff Syracuse. Hi, Jeff. So the work of the Metro Arts Commission is really anchored in organizations like many of you that are represented today. And I'm going to ask everyone one more time to raise your hand if you are representing an arts organization. Thank you all for your support. Without you, we could not do the work that we do. And I'd also like to acknowledge our relationship with Mayor Carl, Carl Dean. He has been very supportive and very instrumental in our journey, and so we would love to thank him, and if you ever run into him, just tell him thank you for what you've done for the arts. And I'm also, I would be remiss if I did not recognize the wonderful members of the Metro Nashville Arts Commission. Would you please stand? It is because of your hard work that we are here today, and we are very, very proud of the plan that we are going to present to you. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce our wonderful executive director, Ms. Jennifer Cole. Wow, you know how to get into the head of a former theater nerd. Um, can everybody hear me in the back? Okay, wow, I'm so excited that you're here and excited that we have a full house. Um, before I dive further in, I, I want to specifically thank the Nashville Children's Theater and uh, Catherine Colgrove um, and Scott Copeland and Bob Roberts, who've been a great host for us here at the Children's Theater. Let's please give the Children's Theater a round of applause. They had a full house of elementary school kids until about 12.45, and as all great arts organizations do, flip this room lickety-split for us to do this event, and we're really happy to be here. Um, I also would be very remiss if I did not thank our staff team at Metro Arts for all the work that they have done leading up to this plan, and they do every single day. Um, I'm really blessed to work with, I think, the smartest people in the whole wide world, um, and I'd like to thank my staff. So. Paula is absolutely right. Um, we are standing here because all of you artists, arts organizations, arts businesses, gallery owners, um, have worked together to make Nashville one of the strongest art cities in America. We have been very blessed by a mayor um, who has consistently supported the arts and public art, and by a city council who, for the last um, several years, has um, raised our budget um, and continued to invest in the work that all of you do. Um, I'm really excited today um, to talk about our new strategic plan, um, and I hope you are too. I'm going to invite all of you to live tweet with us, if you so care, with hashtag CreativeCity and at MetroArts1, which is our handle on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Um, and uh, I'm going to dive right in. Um, oh, wait. How could I do that without thanking the consultant who actually herded enough cats to get us here? Um, Victoria Plettner Saunders is somewhere out there. She is wonderful from VPS Cartography. And Kia Jarman, who is lovely and red and probably tweeting as we speak, um, who helped us really craft this uh, plan about crafting, if one can have that much Etsy metaphor in one conversation. Um, and so uh, without further ado, I felt like it was really important for us to sort of um, go back and talk about the work we've done in the last five years. In January, I celebrated my fifth anniversary um, with Metro Arts, and um, we did our first strategic plan at the very end of 2010, 
right in the middle of a recession and as we were pulling out of a flood. And so the conditions in which we planned our work were quite different. Um, and I'm really proud of the accomplishments that we can all share together. And I want to go over them um, for a, a handful of minutes. Here's the format we're going to use today. I'm going to talk for about half an hour, and someone in the back is going to give me a hard stop so I don't keep talking and talking. Um, and then it's going to be open um, questions. Um, you also have sticky notes in your, um, your programs or your um, executive summaries. And there are walls in the back. Um, Stephanie Pruitt, my beautiful board member, is back there. She's under the questions one. And Pepe Presley, my other fantastic board member, is standing on the, under the I'm really excited one. And um, at the end, as, you, as you're going along, if there's something that we t we're talking about that really excites you, we'd like to capture that. Um, please feel free to put that out on social media, too. And if you have questions, we want to capture that. Um, this is a public conversation, so we can be as transparent about what we're thinking, why, and how um, today and going forward. Um, so we felt like it was really important to sort of give you a high-level snapshot of this agency and what it's accomplished in the last five years. Um, in particular, I think the most important thing that happened in our last strategic plan was a realignment of this agency to be about community. Not about one particular organization, not about one particular art form, not about public art, not about grants, but around everyday citizens participating in the arts in our community. And that fundamental shift of thinking of ourselves as a community agency versus only an arts agency has driven every single other piece of the work. And at the end of the day, I get up thinking about how a second grader in Bordeaux or how a senior citizen off Smith Springs Road, or how someone in my, on my own street in Fatherland Street in East Nashville is participating in the arts, buying a season subscription, coming to your after school program, and buying your work. That's, at the end of the day, who our customer is, the citizen of the, of the city of Nashville. Um, and I think we'll, as we go over our accomplishments, we're really sort of focused on that. I'm going to start with public art, because this was the hottest topic button when I first came and went in our strategic plan. I am thrilled to say that in the last five years, we have increased the public art collection in the city by 700%. Um, <laughs> um, and that number is important because half of those commissions have gone to local or regional artists. And we have continued to focus on a path of bringing international, high caliber, well-known public artists into our city collection on a similar and parallel path in cultivating and developing local artists like Bryce McLeod and Brenda Stein, who are sitting in the audience with us, um, and all of the artists, local artists and regional artists who have um, done our bike rack programs. It is really, really important to us to continue on this path of building our collection that adds international value and local value to artists as we develop them. Um, we've also, for the first time ever, secured NEA funding for our work in Edmondson Park and brought two living legends into the public collection and were written up in the Wall Street Journal, which we believe is important. We've run na won national recognition in 2012 for Reflection, our Lawrence Argent piece in Shelby Park. We launched in, in January uh, the first ever mobile platform, um, which we continue to add to every day, um, allowing more citizens to interact not only with the public collection, but with art in public places that is generated by artists like you in your neighborhood. We want every citizen to know about the public collection, know about art in public places, and feel like it belongs to them, and that it's part of their neighborhood experience. Um, the other thing that I don't know if everybody knows is that we have a long-range partnership with the Ayers Institute at Lipscomb to develop lesson plans um, related to the public art collection in everything from engineering to math to science. Public art's a great way to teach all core subject matter, and we've had a fantastic partner in Lipscomb who works with us to bring Metro teachers into the design development process and make those lesson plans free and available to any school teacher, any homeschool parent, um, and any private school instructor who wants to use them. They're free and available on our website and on Lipscomb's. So in a few short years, we've really transformed the public art program from a handful of installation pieces to a really well-rounded program that is about engaging the citizen in art. And I have a fantastic team, and you should give them a round of applause. Uh, <laughs> 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 
similarly, we did actually did not have a community engagement function four years ago within our, um, within our, within our agency. And so one of the key learnings from the, the first round of listening to you in the community on um, our first strategic plan was actually to build out programming that filled a gap or that raised the bar for all of you related to, to arts participation. And so we have launched a series of direct programs to the community that we believe add value and are filling gaps that are not otherwise there, including Arttober Nashville that has um, engaged more than half a million citizens directly in the arts in October. We're celebrating our fifth year this year and many, many, many of you are partners in that shared equity initiative. Um, Poetry in Motion, which brings um, local poems into the bus, the bus system and is part of a national initiative. And Thrive, our microfunding program that was supported by the Metro Council this year. We are actually almost out of money. I have a great problem, which is giving money away um, to artists to do neighborhood placemaking projects, which is fantastic. Uh, we initiated a, a long-range project with an NCAA Final Four that many, many of you participated in and added, and literally thousands of school children um, participated in arts and sports-related programming leading up to the Women's Final Four last year. We hosted the highest participation Americans for the Arts annual convention ever. Um, last year, we reformatted most of our social platforms and news platforms, relaunched our artist directory that has over 400 local artists on it, with Now Play in Nashville, and launched Arts Buzz, which is an artist-only newsletter, which really sort of focuses on the artist community about juried opportunities and other opportunities for artists to sell and exchange their work. Um, this entire area did not exist in our world four years ago, um, and it has significantly moved the needle, we believe, on our community presence, our public value, um, and our connection with all of you, um, we hope. So um, we're really proud of that work and we're proud of what it continues to do. Um, in terms of community grants, um, we have continued even um, in difficult economic times to maintain about $1.9 million in the grants budget each year, um, which is about $4.12 per capita. Um, We've added an after-school and arts access grant specifically to target engagement with some of our under-resourced populations. Um, We've updated and added one of the very first in the country outcomes grants based measurements programs in a grants, an arts grants program. Um, we moved all of our grant making online, which I know is sometimes bumpy, but it's at least online. Um, and uh, uh, we, have, uh, we have really continued to, in the national space, um, evolve the conversation about outcomes measurement in arts programming, uh, which is, as always, an evolving conversation. We're really proud of both the partners that we have in the grants program and how we're moving actually an investment portfolio versus a grants program. We think that that's what this money is and what it does. It invests in all of you and leverages community impact and partnerships um, that you all facilitate each and every day. Ah. And here's the deal. Every single one of these partners, in some cases, 100 grantees is a lot of partners that just had one little line. I was trying to fit this all on one slide. Every single one of these partners is a new initiative for us. One of the fundamental things that we have initiated about our work and you'll can see going forward is that we do everything in collaboration. There is a shared equity value to building an arts ecosystem that only happens when we all work together towards some similar and common goals. And this is, incre this is probably the most powerful slide to me is that each of us have worked together to sort of move this needle and hopefully we'll continue to do so. So before I go into our plan, I wanted to sort of address a question of how does our plan relate to the recently um, released National Next plan? How many of you have read that, looked at that, participated in it in any way, shape, or form? Right on. Okay. Um, I wanted to sort of say a high level, Metro Arts participated as one of uh, many city agencies who sort of coordinated conversations related to the strategic plan. Um, and there is a chapter in Nashville Next that really talks about sort of four key areas um, for arts, culture, and creativity. And at a high level, they are arts access, making sure more Nashvillians have arts access, lifelong arts education within the school system and the higher ed system and the public community. 
creating a healthy creative workforce, which is all around economic development and job creation, and diverse cultural neighborhoods. You will see these themes pop up in our specific plan. The fundamental difference I want to articulate here, and you will see in the narrative, is that Nashville Next is a citywide plan. It involves lots of city departments as well as the private sector. So there are arts and cultural things that other, other partners and other players besides us will do. And our plan really articulates of those kind of key themes and then others that were identified in our public conversations, what Metro Arts specifically will focus on in the next couple of years. There are other things the rest of the city may do that the Chamber of Commerce they may do that economic development that the public school system may do related to arts and culture. Um, this plan will sort of take some of these tendrils and drill down into our agency's specific outcomes and objectives for the next five years. Um, okay, so how do we come up with this plan? How many of you participated in some way, shape, or form in a focus group, a public conversation related to our plan? Raise your hand. So a lot of you. Um, one of the things that we did was work in parallel with the planning department around Nashville Next. So several public conversations that happened in Nashville Next actually had an arts and culture or creative economy set of conversations with that, them, and we grabbed all that data um, and rolled it also into ours so that we were making use of a public planning conversation that was happening. We then had a commission retreat, a full staff retreat with our, uh, with our commission to identify issues of strategic value to our agency, um, internal and external. Um, we had six focus groups in December that were moderated by Kia and Victoria. And then we pulled all that together into set a series of internal staff and board sessions where we really teased out across all of that public information and, and feedback from each of you, what were the big, hairy ideas that we really needed to wrestle with and tackle. Okay. So I just wanted to highlight what we heard over and over as major strategic opportunities for our agency and also the city. Um, one is that there was a momentum of public planning and public conversation about the future of the city that was fueled by Nashville Next, um, and that there is, we believe, a real arts, culture, creative economy value um, as a differentiating factor for our city. Anybody who works in the music industry will tell you we have something special and that we need to continue to focus on that differentiating factor as we build our city, um, and that goes to arts and culture and creative economy. Um, that there was public engagement already around issues of neighborhood infrastructure infrastructure, quality of life, and affordability, all of which were major issues we heard from artists and creators when we talked in the community. Certainly not something that only our agency deals with or only our agency should deal with, but they are bottom line issues for creators in the community. Um, uh, there is an increasing socioeconomic and ethnic diversity in our community, which we believe is a beautiful thing and a huge strategic opportunity for the arts and culture ecosystem. We have really strong business partners, community partners, um, and we want to sort of build on the existing strength of partnerships. Our theory of change increasingly is not aligned with many national arts funders like Kresge and Serdna and Art Place America, and we felt like that the strength of kind of the direction we already were in was lining up with potential trickle down um, from the public, the private sector, particularly the philanthropy sector. Um, we increasingly, through city council members, through neighborhood associations, get increased demand for cultural programming and public art for neighborhoods. And we're not alone. Our partners in the parks department and the libraries department are increasingly asked to sort of deliver cultural programming at the neighborhood level, and we know that that is a citizen demand and something that we need to pay attention to. And last, each and every one of you, we have grown our local creative workforce. There are more artists who live here, more makers who live here. Our cultural organizations that we fund have almost increasingly, across the board, grown in budget and size. So sort of we're growing as a community, and those, that is a strategic opportunity we need to think about. Overall, here's what we heard from you during the our feedback process about what we do, we do pretty well that we do advocacy and public leadership pretty well, that we do a pretty good job connecting the dots between artists, agencies, and the rest of the ecosystem, that we do a pretty good job linking the arts with other city priorities like public health or, um, or um, flood recovery, et cetera, um, and that you, a lot of you like Dr. Arttober. In fact, you wanted us to do it each and every month, which <laughs> almost made Rebecca have a panic attack. And, um, 
So there was a lot of more, 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 more uh, related to that one, which is, which is great. Um, we also heard from you that there are areas we needed to improve. And these are not the only ones, but these are the sort of overwhelming ones. One is that our brand is a little unclear. People still don't know if we're a nonprofit or if we're part of the government. Some of our stuff doesn't tie together and you really don't like our logo. That's okay. <laughs> we're good. I put my big girl pants on today. Um, the second is that, as this is not a surprise, that we want more money for the arts and culture sector, both for individual artists and for arts organizations. Okay. Um, that, that, we, that there are some opportunities for us to streamline and make easier our grants processes, um, and that we need to do a better job of enhancing both our own data collection and public reporting, but also helping our partners collect data and evaluation around impact reporting. All good. Um, and then this is actually a word cloud of some data that we collected of words that we heard over and over again about us from you. And I was really struck by the diversity, the neighborhoods, and sort of how this word cloud really does reflect that our work is about a community, not just about sort of one piece of the community. And I felt like it was a really good representation of f reflecting back to you what we heard that you think we are or that we should be concerned about. And the good news is we're also concerned about those same things. The other thing we heard over and over is that you want us to focus on the whole ecosystem. And that's something that's hard. It takes um, different kinds of tools and resources. And you'll see in our strategic plan that um, some of it is flexing to deal with new partners um, and new parts of the ecosystem that we maybe haven't done um, in the past. OK. So let's see if I can get my fancy things to work. So. Here's how we're going to, I know. <laughs> Those of you who know me will know that I asked Rebecca yesterday what an animation was. And she said, <laughs> she said, everybody has a talent and this is not yours. Um, and she's right. Um, so the first thing that, um, that we, were, we want to do and how we want to work in the next five years is we want to expand things that work deepen efforts that add value to all of you, whether it's a specific project like Arttober, whether it's an evaluation toolkit, and we want to support data collection that tells the story for everybody. We don't want to do a lot of new things. We want to deepen the things that are working and adding value. We want to be a knowledge and policy leader. We heard over and over from you that somehow us playing a role of collecting things and pushing them back out provides value um, to the sector, whether you're an individual artist or whether you're an agency, that somehow that role of kind of collecting and convening is an important one that you want us to keep doing. So OK, we'll keep doing that. Um, and then the last thing is around co collaboration. Clearly, there are lots of people facilitating collaboration, but we heard loud and clear that this was an area that you wanted us to keep working in, particularly around big conversations for the sector, which we'll talk about in a second, and things that drive collective impact for all of us. Um, awesome. OK. So stop talking, Jen, and get to the details, um, which is, that's kind of how we got here. I'm going to do um, a high level on each of the kind of key areas of our plan, and then I'm going to give a full stop half an hour for any question that you want to ask. OK? Sound good? Heads nod. Awesome. OK. Um, so one of the fundamental things that we did, we had this fantastic, wonky, metro-sounding mission statement that I could never actually remember. And so this policy, this uh, strategic plan allowed us an opportunity to streamline something that is like straight up elevator speech, and I'm really excited about it, and you all might be able to say it and remember it when you leave. Um, that our mission is to drive a vibrant and equitable community through the arts. So, yay, right? <laughs> so, yeah, I'm super excited about this because it fundamentally puts the emphasis on community and impact and that our work isn't, about, isn't the art form of, in and of itself, the, the, the conduction of art is fantastic. It is not transactional, it's transformative. And we believe that that's what the arts are in the community. We believe that's what each of you contribute to every day. And we wanted a mission statement that went along with that excitement. And so this is the new adopted mission of our commission. We are super excited about it. And I hope you are too. Um, we also updated our values. This is sort of how we get up every day and think about the work, um, how it drives internal decision making, um, and how it drives strategic partnership and collaboration opportunities in the community. 
One is that culture is rooted in community. We're not giving something to community. We're pushing up and out cultural and creation that already exists within this community. We have deep resources. Um, we have deep levels of creation and artistic in innovation. And we are, our job is to release that, not bring it in. Arts for everyone. It's not about subscribers only or a certain set of folks. It's for everyone, every single person that lives in our community. We believe artistic excellence drives community excellence. The better each of you are at your work and your individual creative practice, the better the community is as a whole. That that is a strategic value, both economic and in terms of quality of life for this whole community. Strong arts, strong community. Kind of the same as the other one, but one's more focused on artistic excellence. And that we believe collaborations are the way that we sort of get to ch community change and that they do create shared value. So these are sort of fundamental guiding principles for all of our work. Many of you are familiar with our theory of change. We have made one slight tweak to this theory of change. We will continue always to work on sort of three outcome areas that we want for long range change. One is stronger creative workers. How many of you consider yourself a creative worker? Yeah, I work for you. All day long, I try to make the conditions in the community, our agency tries to make the conditions in the community better for creative workers, a better place for them to do their work. The second is deeper cultural participation. The more people have a profound aha experience with arts and culture, the more likely they are to send their children to classes in all of your institutions. They are more likely to buy art in your galleries. The more likely they are to value it in public conversation, the more likely they are to sort of work in the creative professions. And all of that drives vibrancy. And then the last is neighborhoods. Where does, the, where does this engagement happen? Where does the aha moment happen? It happens in neighborhoods. It happens in the downtown neighborhood with many of our large cultural institutions. It happens in Antioch. It happens in Hip Donaldson. It happens at neighborhoods. And it is contingent upon a public agency to think about the delivery system and the exchange system of arts and culture at the neighborhood level. And so you'll see in our work focusing on how we're building dynamic and vibrant creative neighborhoods for everyone. Can I get an aha? Uh -huh? All right, I kind of want a more church experience here with that one. All right. All right. Um, so we're going to do that by four key strategies. We're going to, and then we're going to get into the deep. One goal is to increase more resources for the sector. And I know everybody just heard me say more money. OK? I know that, but that's what you heard. Um, and that is true. We're going to talk about the creative ecosystem and the sector and, phys and financial resources. But we're also going to talk about resources of professional development and shared equity. That at the end of the day, the sector needs to grow stronger and resources um, tools are a part of that conversation, and that's something that our agency is uniquely positioned to do. The second is to drive access and equity. I don't think it's a surprise that even if you look at the data that we've robustly collected over the last handful of years, that we still have large swaths of our city population that are not participating um, related to how they represent themselves in, in our demographics, in our cultural institutions, in our galleries, and in our purchases. We can do better as a city with getting more Nashvillians to participate across the arts. And we can do better with sort of pushing up and out the existing work of artists of color and artists of all socioeconomic backgrounds. We can do better. We should do better. And we want to drive that conversation. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Yay! All right, I got a hallelujah in the back, I think. I'm so excited. Um, uh, and then we can improve creative infrastructure. So I, uh, the 1,001 question is, when are we going to build a new theater for 250 people? Because um, I know all of you want to rent that theater, like now. Um, uh, that's one way of looking at infrastructure. The other way is looking at how are patterns of exchange of culture happening in neighborhoods. So what can we do with the physical infrastructure of communities? But what can we do with the, the social equity inf infrastructure between people in neighborhoods that make them better conduits for arts and culture and honestly are creating people that will come to your institutions for a year to come? And the last is lead by example. We can't do any of this if we don't do a good job internally as an organization. So I'm going to talk a little bit of high level things and then ask more questions. So each of you have in front of you the executive summary. There's a longer document that has a little bit more detail, all of which is on our website and live at this moment that you can get at another time. We're going to keep doing 
the things that you love. We're going to keep doing basic operating grants. We're going to keep doing Arttober. We're going to keep doing Poetry Motion. Um, we have asked for an increase in Thrive. Um, I don't know if it will happen, but we're going to keep pushing the things that you have told us add value. Um, we're going to continue to try to get more dollars into those alternative tools like Thrive. Here's a, here's a stat. We funded 27 Thrive projects since October, supporting 47 individual artists, most of whom had never come to the table because they weren't eligible for grants funding, and more than half of them were artists of color, almost 85% of the projects in low-income neighborhoods. That is a tool that we need to keep using to drive the equity conversation, and that was $40,000. Incredibly powerful, and we want to sort of do more of that. Eventually, we want to align our grants with the community outcomes that we just talked about. It won't happen today, but over the next five years, there will probably be some tweaking of grant categories to better align with the outcomes that we're talking about. Here's the big we. We have identified that Nashville, compared to its peer cities, does not have the same level of cultural investment. We believe, not today, not tomorrow, not in the state of Metro that Mayor Dean will deliver, but over the long haul, over five years, that we need to initiate a public conversation about right-sizing the amount of cultural investment in the city. I do not know what that will look like. I don't want to pretend. The, the um, Metro Arts Commission will appoint a task force this summer to look at options, and we hope come up with a series of ideas that may, over time, change that conversation. Um, because in addition to being a competitive advantage with our peer cities from an economic development standpoint, I think each and every one of you know that it's a quality of life issue for the neighborhoods that we live in to have, be invested in our artists and our cultural institutions. And we believe it is a long-term goal, um, and we believe that it is something worthwhile for our agency to strategically lead. We will only be able to do that with you. Um, in addition, we have that awesome 700% increase in our public art collection. But you know what? We don't have an ongoing way to fix that public art collection. Um, and uh, we also know that temporary art projects are a great way for many local artists to begin to get their foot in the door with long-term public art projects. We believe that considering and looking and researching opportunities for us to fund more temporary public art commissions allows more local artists to be competitive locally and, national and nationally in the public art scene. So all three of these areas are areas we've identified as gaps that we will strategically look at opportunities for funding. Some of those may be public, some of them may be private. My guess is most of them will be a combination because we're not sort of saying that one specific sector needs to do all of this. What we're saying is sort of there are gaps and disconnects in right-sizing the investment in cultural arts and artists in this community. Um, and I hope that all of you will come along on this journey with us um, because it will take a community to move the needle on any of these conversations. And then the last is that there are a variety of emerging councils looking at various creative industries, um, the Film, Television, and Transmedia Council, the Fashion Alliance. Um, more and more there are sort of creative workforce groups that are sort of emerging, and we want to be an asset and a resource to those groups as they need our support. Um, does that mean finance? Probably not, but it does mean technical assistance and support and just connections. Um, we believe this resource issue, whether it's time or talent or financial resources, is something that moves all of you to a better place. Is that a truth? Okay. That's what we heard. We heard the money thing. We heard the money thing. Um, and we believe that more resources and more growth equals more innovation for all of you, regardless of where you are in the ecosystem. So here's this one. We want to drive cultural access, equity, equity, access, and inclusion. Um, and here's what that means for us. That means more people from more backgrounds participating in more institutions and more creators um, from a different backgrounds who are well known and sort of integrated in, in, the, in the ecosystem. We've been doing some great stuff around that. We have ongoing partnerships. I saw Adam from NASA, who's, who is my buddies from NASA, um, and uh, the Oasis Center, and Music Makes Us, the, the Public School Music Engagement Initiative, um, who've really been working with at-risk and marginalized students to, have, to, 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 to narrow their access to, to the arts. Um, we want to continue to deepen those partnerships. We want to work with public institutions like the Transit Authority and the Housing Fund on things that um, bring more people into um, into the arts and sort of level that playing field. Um, 
I'm going to talk about, um, we're going to also appoint an equity advisory group of citizens to help us think about our internal programming and then what we could do better sort of inside our world, but what are sort of the ideas, technical assistance, even potential funding that we can do to move the needle on arts um, equity access and inclusion. It includes things like new partnerships with the Center for Independent Living um, to look at the ability access issues within our own programs, but then potentially within each of yours. Um, and I'm really excited today um, to talk about a pilot that we're going to be initiating with the CURB Center for Art Enterprise um, and Public Policy at Vanderbilt. Raise my hands, CURB people. All right. Um, so the CURB Center has already um, been initiating a public scholars program to really sort of study how arts and culture resource, research impacts public policy. And in partnership with CURB this summer, um, Jyoti Gupta, who's here somewhere, um, will be doing some research with us with our major cultural institutions on what's, what are you doing awesome around cultural access and inclusion that we need to tell more people about? What are the gaps? What are the barriers? What could we learn? And then we will be initiating a learning cadre um, where cultu large cultural institutions can apply and we will have a facilitated learning conversations with residents of the community about where we can do better and how we can move the needle. Um, not in a punitive way, but in a public learning conversation for a year so that we can then make decisions about how we tweak investments, what national funding we go after, and what technical assistance and training we conduct with the sector to help change that conversation. I don't ever want to presuppose we know how to move that needle. What we want to do is create opportunities for conversations, and CURB is going to help us um, facilitate that, bring in national lecturers um, about that issue, and open that up for a public conversation. And we hope by being a model of saying publicly, we don't know what we don't know, that it will help all of us move to the next place. Um, because here's the end of the day, this is our audience in 20 years, and this is who's, this is, these are critical community residents that have as much right to access and participate in the arts as any of us do, and we need to sort of narrow that gap. Um, this is our big last area um, around infrastructure. So um, I'm going to talk about a highlight of a couple of things that, um, that we're going to keep working on. We've been working with um, economic development and planning and um, zoning department around uh, continuing to look at um, our land use policies and how they might um, sort of help or, or hurt artists. Um, we've introduced an artisan manufacturing bill that's sponsored by Councilman Stein that we believe is going to sort of help makers. Um, and we'll continue over the next five years to look at those opportunities where we can play some role in pulling together metro partners to ask those questions. What could we do to make it easier to create in this community? And sometimes it's really simple. And sometimes it's just about public conversation, but our job, we think, is pulling those conversations together. And sometimes they'll result in a policy change, and sometimes they'll just result in human beings having better conversations. And that's OK. Um, we believe our city has grown to the place where we need a public art master plan um, and hope to be able to move forward on funding a public art master plan. Um, uh, that would allow a public conversation about how we want our collection to grow um, and where we want it to grow over the next um, five to ten years. Um, I think I saw Paul Johnson laying around here somewhere. There he is from the Housing Fund. We're super excited to be working with the Housing Fund, um, to, um, who is a community development financial institution, to think about some alternative products for artists and makers that make it easier for them to purchase and renovate their spaces. Um, we believe affordability of um, production space is a really critical issue now and in the future. And we want to work with community partners who have tools that make that easier for artists and makers to do the work that they love and that we love. Um, and then uh, we have a pending application in front of the National Endowment for the Arts to, um, to basically take the community learning from the Thrive program and turn it into a boot camp for new public artists. Um, we know that many local artists want to move into the public art space. We know that things like we know that things like insurance and contract management get in the way. <laughs> uh, we want to bring in national conversations and national partners um, 
through the Ayers Institute um, for Civic Leadership and combine their assets and resources in civic engagement with our assets in public art to create a whole new cadre of local public artists um, who have the training and the expertise that they need to be competitive in public art. So we want to do a series of things that we think ultimately will impact and make neighborhoods stronger. Um, okay. And then we're going to do a succession plan because I might not be here forever, which is a good thing. Um, we're going to do uh, uh, some brand alignment. We're going to fix our evaluation program. Um, and we're going to continue to roll up the work we're talking about into national public conversations around public policy and change. Because the more you are examples nationally, the more resources come back here. Um, and we feel like it's our job to elevate the great work that each of you are doing. So this is another word cloud that was generated during um, a Nashville Next session on creative placemaking. And this is, we asked the question, what does culture and creation mean to you? And I found it fascinating, all the variety of answers, which I think reinforces the fact that we need to support a variety of cultural engagement in the ecosystem. Everything from putting arts in public spaces to clearly transit's a big issue, like that's a big aha moment for everybody, um, in case you haven't been following public dialogue for the last two years. Um, and then, uh, but that there really is a diversity of what people want and that we need to be able to support that entire um, continuum from soup to nuts with leadership engagement and constantly pushing big, hairy, sometimes unwieldy questions. Um, and now I'm done. And uh, yeah, that's Lonnie Holly and Mayor Dean um, when we dedicated Edmondson Park this past year. Lonnie likes to say thumbs up to Mother Universe because he channels, he channels happiness into everything he does in his, in his art practice and that was uh, what we wanted to send out to you. So. Um, I, our full report is again online and I hope you'll all look at it, but I want to stop and ask for thoughts, questions, pushback, concern, any and all, in no particular order. Rebecca has a uh, microphone and she's going to, um, I'll start on this side of the room. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, and um, I guess as I work at a center for artists, and the first question that comes to mind for me is what has made it implemented by Metro Arts from a group that has, you know, active artists. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that has active artists and, you know, different arts programs going on. How can we facilitate all of this? Well, that's a fantastic first question. Um, I, I think. I think one is to be engaged and to sort of just be, be here, be listening. Tell other artists, tell other makers that you're working with that this is our direction. Um, I imagine over the next handful of years, particularly the next year, um, we will be doing more calls for serving on task forces or being interested. I think the single best way that any individual can support the arts in the community is actually by joining the National Arts Coalition, which is the advocacy group that works to sort of support the arts and particularly public funding for the arts. And I think that's an easy first step. There's stuff out there um, about how to do that. It's easy and online. But I think, tell us, what, tell us also how you want to help. I mean, we recruit art. We recruit folks for public grant panel reviews, for public art reviews. Like citizen engagement is part of our business process, but it's also part of the processes of most of the agencies we support. So one, keep asking the question, and if you don't get the answer you want, ask it again. Um, and then I think connect with others uh, of like mind. I think is the best way. Right. So, thanks. I'm gonna let. We're getting some feedback from the speaker. Could okay. Just repeat his question. Yes. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Um, okay, so Jennifer, thank you for this. Um, we, we know that artists gentrify neighborhoods. We've been doing that for years in this country, other places in the world. And <clears throat> so that's good for the neighborhood, that's good for Nashville. And I think that paradigm works at a national level, where, for example, in trying to attract talent from Silicon Valley, if we emerge as a national art city, we'll have so much easier time attracting national talent. To, to Nashville. So recognizing that artists drive this, 
I really get that you're doing a beautiful job working with arts organizations that it's really come together. What systems do you have in place to systematically, on a regular basis, listen to artists and what we have to say? Well, that's a great question. I'm going to try and summarize it for those of you who didn't hear. Um, the basic question is, how are you listening to artists and what are the processes that are in place? So. Uh, I would answer that in a couple ways, which is we try hard to be out in communities listening to individual groups, both neighborhood groups and artists, and artists are our neighbors, that's, that's one. Um, two, artists are always invited to any of the public engagement stuff that we do. We, we try to sort of have artists as sort of an active part of Arttober, of, of Thrive, et cetera. Um, I would say if you feel like we're not doing a good job listening to artists or sort of hearing what they have to say, then tell us that. We would like to know your ideas for sort of how we can listen to that better. Um, again, our our goal is to sort of talk about the whole ecosystem. And if, if we're not sort of doing a, a good job at one piece of it, we'd like to know how we can sort of do that better. Uh, that's the way I would, the short answer for that question. Track us down. <laughs> Pardon? I will try hard to track you down. Sometimes, you know, I don't know where you live or, you know, and, and uh, yeah, well, good, I live in East Nashville, too. Um, and so that's the other thing is the more we know who you are, the more you follow our stuff, follow us on Facebook, the more you sign up for our newsletters, then we have your information and we can tell you um, and you, you can tell us. And so part of that is my request is uh, we want to engage with you. Please engage with us, too. Um, question, I'm going to go to that side of the room since no one's raised their hand. No one? Smile, nod, no one? Okay. What, uh, what kind of communications with city planners are you guys doing in incorporating, like as we're developing the city and growing, like building all of these new condos and hotels as far as getting arts and artists um, being able to contribute to how the infrastructure of the city is going to look in a few years? Um, well, I, I think, one, in the Nashville Next plan, we've talked really importantly, there's actually an entire infrastructure section of the Nashville Next plan that talks about how public art is an important tool of infrastructure, along with roads and streets. And, and um, so I think acknowledging that public art and, art and art is a sort of component of community infrastructure was, a, was an important first step. I think that in terms of the private sector, um, Metro Arts, as a public agency, tends to put its priority because of our limited resources on working with public sector development, like the riverfront, like the convention center, things that the city is working on and the city is resourcing. I think our goal would be, as we're doing resources, research particularly on how we fund um, temporary art and on and, and public art maintenance, is to look at opportunities that other cities have done related to private developer incentives and opportunities for um, the developer community to sort of better integrate that. So I think that there are opportunities as we raise the dialogue around the importance of arts integration into urban planning um, for the private sector to also sort of engage in that conversation. In fact, we already know of developers, in fact, developers seek us out often who are uh, on their own accord integrating public art and artist spaces into their work. Uh, we want to continue to do that. Um, I, I won't name names, but I mean, I can think of four developers right now who have reached out to us about their own initiative to do that. And I think there are opportunities for the city over time to think through if there are potential um, non-financial incentives for um, developers to do that in their, in their, in their work. So. Do you another one? Let's, do you want to go in Let the... Let me get Nancy real quick and then we'll, we'll go, go to the other side okay. of the room. Cool. Rebecca, hand me a microphone. It's very dangerous. <laughs> Hi. Um, Nancy Van Rees, uh, I think I know a lot of you guys from uh, working in the arts community, uh, both as executive director of the Nashville Shakespeare Festival for three seasons and two years over at the Nashville Symphony, uh, and now currently as a, a freelance, uh, uh, really, communication strategist. I am also a candidate for Metro Council in, up in District 8, which is North <laughs> Maplewood, uh, North Inglewood, Maplewood, and Madison. And in my communications with a lot of the developers, as we were talking about, uh, the, there is a great interest from private developers about how to really implement cultural ideas into their new plans. And I know that, that I plan to, and I've talked to several different developers as part of my platform up in District 8, and I see Jeff Syracuse is here as well over at Donaldson. 
that a lot of the new folks running for Metro Council have this in their radar. So if you know people in your districts, if you know the folks that are running for at large or at mayor, uh, mayor positions, um, that we actually bring this up in communication, that we actually challenge these ideas to come forward, and that we challenge folks to make it part of their platform. I've told uh, developers point blank, if, if you want public funding for your private development, I'm not just going to ask you to put trees and parking in the right place. I'm going to ask for public art. I'm going to ask for cultural installations created and developed by Nashvillians. And I have gotten no pushback from that at all. So I encourage that that's going to happen. And I encourage you all to make sure and talk to your folks about uh, encouraging that development. I see Craig Hoover in the back. He's got his hand way up. So I, I, I love this. Uh, I love this the uh, strategic plan. My question is: Is what didn't make it on here? What did you decide? Because I'm sure you guys threw a lot of things up on the wall. And what just couldn't stick because of research, resources uh, not being where they were, staff uh, limitations? What did you want to do in here that couldn't quite make it in? Oh, Craig. <laughs> um, well, here's the deal. This is a straw man because five years is a long time. So there are some things that are not tactically put on there that I actually hope we get to as pieces unfold. There are a lot of things that we want to do around cultural equity and access investment in terms of new grant investments, in terms of innovation funding, in terms of funding interesting collaborations that we're not there yet because the resources aren't there yet, but we want to get there. So there are some tactical ideas that all flow into these big boxes that we just outlined that we're real excited about. But once we put it in writing, and if we don't have, re it, it becomes a, my favorite word, unfunded mandate, and we don't want to do that. So, um, so I think that there are a lot of kind of detail things that as, as we kind of get better about thinking about how do we move the sector on access and equity, that might show up there. Or if the resource um, allocation issue is, moves the needle, then I think we can get to some stuff. The other thing is, we want to keep hearing from you all about what we need. Because you know, in 2010, this city was fundamentally different than it is right now. To presuppose what we know, we will know in five years is just a little bit of a silly um, exercise. So th th that's some of the stuff that didn't end up there. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I will tell you one of the biggest other issues that the commission sort of went back and forth on is our role in public schools. Um, we have really wonderful arts leadership in our public schools with Nola Jones and Lori Schell. I think um, uh, Jay, uh, I think Jay and uh, Jesse Register have put a lot of emphasis on the importance of the arts. I think that's a big question mark going forward, but I don't know that that's the role of our agency. Um, I think it's the role of our agency to cultivate artists, to support their engagement with the public school system. I think it's to make robust cultural institutions that have fantastic programs that challenge students. But there is a question about kind of arts education, I think, that's out there. And we felt like in terms of all of the other things that were that were critically important to move us forward, that a giant investment in sort of pub private sector arts education without the resources was probably not a good strategic move. So I would say that's the one that, as a mom of two kids, kind of, I sort of wish was there, but I want to do it smart and I want to do it right. And we have really good internal resources at MNPS um, and really great teachers that, um, that are, can scale. Um, we really, we really do. So, there was one other over here. The emphasis on inclusion and access and equity. I really appreciated that it was not punitive, and the fact that it can be a win-win for the entire city. All we have to do is look at the changing demographics. That's right. We are either with what's going to be the reality of our city or not. I was a little bit disturbed when somebody said that artists drive gentrification. And for many people, gentrification is displacement. And so, so long as we are mindful of that, and that goes back to the equity, inclusion, access issue, then it's fine. But let's be very careful because many, many people get displaced. Right. 
correct. And I, there's actually also some, I didn't mention this, but now we've opened it back up the door. There's actually some good research that sort of disproves that artists drive gentrification um, that's recently come out, that that's a, a fallacy. We like to pin lots of things on artists, and some of them aren't real fun. Uh, and I don't really like that one. Um, I think Sarah had a question. Yeah. Okay, I'll shut up. <laughs> um, my question is, is sort of about numbers. I wanted to, to know, um, is there a certain percentage of the city population that we, we know are interested and are involved in the arts? And do you have a metric going forward? I mean, do we have a 10% participation, 2%? Um, you know, just often when we think about other cities, we're talking about, you know, LA or New York that have a much larger population. Um, larger population, and then you add, you know, percentage of that population is interested, um, and you can have a lot more people involved in the arts, whereas here we have, you know, a smaller population, but do we have a deeper connection to the arts, or do we have any data on that? That's a great question. So, yes and no. We have some data about what we call arts behavior, but that's more retail behavior, sort of how people purchase things, buy bookstores, buy records at record shops. Um, we also collect data from all of our grantees, um, and we know about who's participating and where they are. What we don't know is who's, and this is sort of where we talked about us getting better about evaluation, is so if the opera is giving us a number and the Shakespeare Festival is giving us a number, there may be a repeat client there. <laughs> um, so what we know is that on average, our grantees aggregated are engaging about a million point three people a year in their work. Some of those people are not all Davidson County residents and some of them are duplicate art supporters. So to your question, that's a pretty high number. Um, uh, that's double the population. <laughs> I mean, Nashville has 658,000 people who live in it, so that's pretty good. Um, I think what we've got to get a better d job at is drilling down on that, what you're talking about, and how we're moving the needle on, are those multiple, p are, are we increasing the number who are participating in multiple cultural organizations and buying, uh, buying paintings at galleries, and are we bringing new people into that conversation? Um, it's a rigor, and it's a rigor that's not been really at hand in the art sector um, until very, very recently. And I think we need to do a better job of it. And I think we're going to probably end up asking everybody else to do a better job of it um, with us, for sure. Does that answer sort of the question? OK. Yes. Yes, I'm pointing at you. Uh, amongst all the bullets that I saw on the screen, um, I have difficulty sorting through a bunch of bullets just because I, I think visually. <laughs> Is there space in there for space, facilities, for exhibit, uh, like really world-class exhibit and uh, performance space? So you asked a really good question. So the larger infrastructure question, one of the things we want to do, and actually it was a bullet, but I was running through my bullets. We're actually, the Chamber of Commerce right now is conducting a study called Culture Here that should be finished by the summer. And to your point, we don't have a good data set on what we already have in the city. What's there? What's publicly owned? What's privately owned? And so before we go to the we need X, Y, or Z, we felt like it was a pretty good conversation to sort of try to document what's there. And so part of that study, we, we hope, will be publicly published results of what is there in terms of facilities, publicly owned and privately owned, and where are they, so that the public sector and the private sector can make better decisions of, around those kinds of questions. I believe it will, I mean, when you say public facilities, the library owns a giant set of real estate, the parks department owns a giant set of real estate from the public sector, and then we have lots and lots of private folks sort of in that space. The best job we can do, we feel like, is put data out there and then raise questions around, okay, is there a gap here in exhibit space? Um, or is there a gap in, you know, the sweet spot of performance space, that 250 to 500 seat proscenium that everybody wants. Um, you know, I think that that's where we're at. Um, I think the other thing that we want to be a watchdog for is the affordability of space. We, we get very much that that, particularly from a studio side, is hard. Um, and we want to work with partners in the private sector, people like the Housing Fund, who are thinking through that conversation. Not that we as a government entity can stabilize prices, but that what we can do is create collaborations that raise the importance of that issue. I think we have time for one more question. Um, and then I promise you all a room full of very busy people a hard stop. 
Any other thoughts? About a comment. Yes, Mr. Keaton. No question. Uh, from the uh, Public uh, Government Affairs uh, Committee, it's very important. We're going to lose some very strong uh, supporters of the art with the uh, term limits in the council. I just want to reiterate what our colleague said about uh, getting a commitment, an eyeball to eyeball commitment from candidates for mayor and, uh, and from candidates for council that we meet. Because we're competing with cities like Charlotte, North Carolina, who have a line item that support their arts. Folks, that should be a metro rule. We should be supported by a line item in the metro budget. And as we push for that, you can help us because we're going to get 25 new votes on the council, which can pass most anything that goes toward uh, the council in an ordinance, that number of people. So do support, do get the support from them and tell them that, uh, and this, this lets us segue into the next five-year plan to approach the council for that very thing. Thank you, Mr. Keaton, who is a long-serving member of our board, and we really appreciate everything he does in his neighborhood um, and for the arts. Um, I want to thank all of you for this time. I know there are probably a lot of unanswered questions. If you have a question, um, uh, Jeff Syracuse is sitting underneath the question section. Stick it on your sticky note, and we will collapse them, type them up, and send them back out. Um, if you were really excited about something and you just didn't get a chance to do your hallelujah and you want to share it with us, we would also like to hear that. Um, uh, this will be on Metro 3. Um, when we have the video, we can, we'll send it out via YouTube if you want to circulate this to board members or other people who weren't able to be here. At the end of the day, this only happens with you, and um, we really honestly believe in a partnership conversation. Um, and so I hope that I can count on each of you for that. Um, and uh, I just really want to thank you for your time. So.